Hello everybody, welcome to this week's edition of The Verdict. Plenty to go at this week, courtesy of the Skybet York Ebor Festival. There was uh, lots of quality action from Wednesday through to Saturday, and I've picked five races out that I think are of particular interest. And then we will go to Newmarket, uh, where I think there was a very nice two-year-old performance there on the July course. But it's at York where we start. Let's have a look at the times for what was day one of the festival. The going was quick, it was good to firm, good in places, and the times were commensurate with that all bar one dipping under the racing post standard. Some tremendous performances on the clock, notably from Mustadaf, Continuous and Indian Run. It's Mustadaf where we are going to start the big race of the meeting, the Judmont International. Group one, of course, over a mile and a quarter. And the brilliant uh, Paddington was the six to four on favorite. Mustadaf was three to one, Nashua, 13 to 2, and the Fox is an outsider but supported 11 to 1 from 16s. Let's have a look and see how this race unfolded. And it was Mostadaf who turned Paddington over here. Indeed, Paddington had only managed to finish in third place, for it was Nashua who was in second. The first thing to say about the Jumont International this year is a small field. Well, they've had small fields uh, before, but that uh, didn't stop this being a quality renewal. And what we saw was a complete and utter masterclass from the front from Frankie de Tori. Here he is on Mostadaf, replacing Jim Crowley, of course. Nashua held up as ever and a little bit keen. And the Holly Doyle and Ryan Moore, a stalking position, perhaps a couple of lengths off the leader, Mostadaf, at this stage. The early part of the contest, de Tori saved a bit of petrol on the winner. The first couple of furlongs were not furious. 32.45 through the first couple of furlongs. So he saved a little bit early on while still establishing the lead. And not just a lead, but two or three lengths ahead of Paddington at this stage of the race. The pace, of course, then wound up in quite a long way out. And de Tory did it brilliantly. He gradually built the pace up through the final four furlongs. If you look at the course track sectionals and the results section of the website, 4th furlong 12.07, 5th furlong 11.97, 6th 11.5, 7th 11.35, 8th 11.19. He gradually built the pace up from the front on a horse who loves fast ground and is probably best at 10 furlongs. And here we can flag up furlong 6 as 11.5 when Dettori really was turning the taps on. So Paddington has been asked to go and chase down a horse who's got a lead of what, three lengths perhaps at this stage and who is quickening in front, who is gradually upping the ante in front. And that is asking Paddington a real big question. And he wasn't able to answer that question. Not Ryan Moore's fault at all. He was on a, a brilliant race or sat in second. He's got a toe through the race. But Mostadaf, having been rated superbly by de Tory, with the pace winding up all the time was always going to be hard to run down it's at this stage where he looks endangered de Tory. you think paddington might get him this side nashua far side and indeed paddington and nashua were both faster through the final three furlings uh, paddington is actually faster than the winner through the seventh furlong he went 1108 there proving that the engine is very much still intact but they couldn't catch mustadaf because he'd got an advantage out in front, a class horse winding up the pace. And even if the second and third in here and behind ran faster than him through the final three furlongs, they couldn't bridge the gap. It was an impossible thing to do with Mostadaf getting such a good ride from de Tory. That pace increasing from furlong five to furlong nine. He got a bit tired uh, late on. Just have a look at Paddington. He's just hanging a bit to his left, perhaps suggesting to me that the ground might have been firm enough for him. But the sectional that he ran, that very fast section in the seventh furlong of 11.08, suggests that um, the real Paddington did turn up. Just given how this race was run, he wasn't good enough to chase down uh, Mustadaf, who's a class act on fast ground. He can be ridden in many different ways. He can be held up just off the pace or he can make the running 
as he proved here. And to Jim Crowley's loss as Frankie de Tori's gain. I'd like to just mention Nashua as well. I still think she's shaping like a filly in really good form. Uh, she was very good at Newmarket when she won the Falmouth over a mile. Things didn't pan out for her in the Nassau at Goodwood. She's run a big race here. Uh, once again, she's fast through the final three furlongs. She's got loads of speed and I think it dropped back to a mile once again. Uh, perhaps uh, to the Kipco, the British Champions meeting in October. That might uh, suit her, but that's up to uh, Team Gosden. Frankie de Tori coming back in after winning the Judmont International to the acclaim of the crowd. And I'll tell you what, it might be his final year, but that was a superb front running ride from de Tori. Absolutely brilliant. Young jockeys could learn a lot from that. Well, from a superb Judmont International to the Skybet Great Voltage Stakes Group 2 over a, a just shy of a mile and a half. Gregory, the 8 to 11 favourite. And uh, Frankie de Tori looking for a big race double. Continuous for the Edna Bryan team, 4 to 1, drifting in the market. It was out from 100 to 30. Cast away for Godolphin, 13 to 2, 15 to 2. Artistic star and Canberra legend was a 16 to 1 shot. Very valuable Skybet, a great voltage of stakes, but in essence, uh, a trial uh, for the St. Ledger. Let's see what happened. And the first thing to note is that the early pace was rapid. Look, Gregory there, green sleeves, red cap. He's just missed the break a little bit. He's a bit sleepy in the stalls and slowly into stride as artistic style and Canberra legend go on. Castle way down towards the inside and Ryan Moore dropping in on continuous uh, with the big white face. Now the early pace was fast and contested. The second furlong 11.54 and the third furlong was 11.71 and it was fast and contested because the Tory wanted to get the lead on Gregory. He's on a horse who's a, a very good stayer. He'll definitely stay more than this mile and a half. And I think de Tori was determined that the gallop was going to be honest. But if I'm going to be honest, I think he's perhaps overdone things just a little bit out in front in the early part of this race, leaving him a bit vulnerable late on for look where the winner is sat. He's there. That's Ryan Moore. In my opinion, that's the best jockey in the world, wanting nothing to do with the early gallop. He's happy to let them just get on with it. That tells you something visually about the pace that they were going. Now the race then steadied uh, through the mid section. It was um, a finishing speed percentage of 104.07. So uh, they've tried to grab back a bit of petrol mid race and that's allowed the winner to finish off quite strongly, just over 4% quicker than he ran the rest of the race. But this winner, very interesting performance because he was fastest through each of the final four furlongs. So not long after they turn for home, Continuous makes up his ground and proves to be quicker than all of his rivals through each individual furlong through the final four. It was a, quite an impressive performance. Furlongs 9, 10 and 11 were all sub 12 seconds from Continuous. Now the Tories trying to go again here on Gregory. He tries to pick the pace up once again, having steadied it mid-race. Gregory is a bit one-paced. He's a stayer. He's a strong stayer. Artistic Styles had enough of that gallop that he was involved in. Canberra Legends crying enough. Castle Way's moving up. And here comes Moore with this beautifully timed challenge, recording 35.42 for the final three furlongs. That's comparing to the runner-up here of 36.28. So much, much quicker than cast the way through the final three furlongs. Add to that that he was quicker than the fourth last furlong as well, continuous. And you can say that he was totally dominant. It looks visually as if Gregory is boxing on again in the closing stages, running on to get within a length of Castle Way. If you look at the course track sectionals, that's a bit more to do with Gregory just keeping going and Castle Way getting tired. Don't think it's an indication that you know, given another two furlongs, Gregory would have got back up. But I'm not having that at all, because he used up loads of petrol in the early part of this contest, and that's what did for him. Um, I wonder what de Tori could possibly have done, because the two horses are way out the back now. They wanted to get on with it as well. He could have dropped in behind them, but he might still have been done for tow. And Gregory, well, he remains a leading hope, I think, for the ledger. Uh, easier ground and further. Uh, in trip that's definitely going to suit him and I've got no doubt that he'd stay two miles uh, one day but this winner was very very good 
under a real savvy ride uh, from Ryan Moore, sat out the back and then produced him perfectly. And those course track sectionals say that this was no fluke. This horse was totally dominant in this race and he'll head to uh, the ledger now, I think. He looks like he's going to be a leading contender for that. And if it turns into a, a test of speed, then Continuous might be the one you want to be with at Doncaster. So from those two races on the Wednesday, let's look at the winners on Thursday. It was a, a really good day, emotional one for the margins with Ropey Guest uh, winning a valuable handicap at uh, three o'clock. Uh, sea Theme was quite an impressive winner, dipping over a second under standard. Uh, Warm Heart uh, likewise, 3.24 uh, under standard in what was the Yorkshire Oaks. But I'm going to just concentrate on the last race on the card and a really nice filly in Nigiri. This is a seven furlong contest and she went 0.81 under standard over uh, the seven furlongs and quicker than gushing gold over the same trip in the previous contest. So this was a heritage handicap, it was just for fillies, Unequal Love was 4 to 1, 5 to 1 Sophia Starlight, Nagiri was 5, it was 8 to 1 Naomi Lampaglia and Royal Dress 17 to 2. Tens and bigger uh, the rest. And Nagiri for Hector Crouch and the very much informed uh, Rafe Beckett came out of stall uh, number six on the seven furlong shoot. Uh, second home was Coco Jambon who came from nine. So they're all in the middle uh, principles and the third home was Naomi La Paglia. So why do I think this filly was worth putting in? I didn't put the Yorkshire Oaks in. Well, I can't put every race in, um, but this filly has got a sharp turn of foot and she displays it here in tremendous style. And I think she's a filly that is way ahead of her mark. She won off 80 here. She's a 100 plus filly all day long in my book. And this she was um, one of the best turn of foots we saw throughout the meeting, I think. Uh, York tends to be a track where, whether the straight course or the round course, you want to be prominent. I don't see many horses coming from mid div, quickening up from mid div, even if the pace is quite strong. It tends to last, they tend to keep going, they can tend to keep rolling at York when the Geary does come from off the pace and she's tucked right in at this stage in the middle of the pack just in here and she shows a fine turn of foot. The sixth furlong, she quickened up to an 11.03. That's what won her the race. She flew through that sixth furlong, that's the penultimate furlong, but not only that, she backed it up with 11.98. There she is switched wide right the, the blue sleeves, white face, she's quickening now, doing that 11.03 and backs it up with a sub 12 second furlong. And with that in mind, she is the only horse in the race to go under 12 seconds for the final furlong. They're all getting tired, they're all paying for what was a, a pretty good gallop because the finishing speed percentage is 102.95, so they're, they're not far off 100, it's not far off a good even gallop. And she has quickened off that quite strong gallop to a tremendous effect and pull clear of her rivals. This was her third win on the bounce and all of the wins have come on different ground. She's won on heavy and this was quick ground and she's won on a ground somewhere in between as well. So she's versatile and she's very, very fast. She's got a sharp turn of foot. Don't think she wants to necessarily go a mile, although she's strong enough at the line. She's got loads of speed and perhaps staying at seven furlongs is what Rafe Beckett will decide to do. Although. There would obviously be more options if he was to think about going a mile. The nice thing about her is she settles, she relaxes, she doesn't pull. And when she's asked to go, she has an electric turn of foot. In behind, well, uh, Coco Jambon ran pretty well in second place, running on quite strongly in those yellow colours on the far side um, and could run in a lesser grade than this. Is Pat one, one to look out for in, in maybe a, a lesser race somewhere down the line. But look how easily this filly as one. Fast time, a mark of 80. She's surely 100 plus and Pat and company must await this filly. Good looking filly and speed is her asset. There's Rafe Beckett coming in to talk to Hector Crouch. He's having a tremendous season, Rafe. His horses can do no wrong at the moment. And I think he's got a very good filly on his hands here. It'll be interesting to see where he goes with her. Let's have a look at uh, Friday now and uh, some interesting results. Coltrane took the Lonsdale in a fast time, 2.48 uh, under the racing post standard. So we're still dealing with really uh, 
quick ground and Battle Cry was a good winner and uh, nearly made it into the verdict but uh, we can't ignore the performance of Live in the Dream in the Nunthorpe 0.63 under the Racing Post standard completing five furlongs in 56.87. To many a shock result Highfield Princess expected to win but she could only finish in second place she was the seven to five favorite Bradsell uh, was uh, third place here and was at nine to two, five to one. Big Evs, the two-year-old. Twilight calls 14, 16's Cardem. And there's Living the Dream, 28's from 33. He's just uh, clipped in a few points. It's 40's bar. So what happened here? Well, Living the Dream is one for the Adam West team from stall number four and has got the better of Highfield Princess, who jumped out of stall number six, Bradsell from nine, Makarova from three. This is the important part of the race. The first furlong is everything that matters as far as living the dream is concerned. Watch stall four, bang, living the dream is away and gone. I had a look at the course track sectionals for the first furlong. Look now, nearly gone a furlong, look how far living the dream is ahead of Highfield Princess. Two lengths possibly. At that point, well, we do know that the first furlong, the winner was 0.26 quicker than Highfield Princess, just through that first furlong, and that equates on fast ground to a length and a half. So Living the Dream was a length and a half quicker through that first furlong that we've just watched than Highfield Princess. And given that the margin, the winning margin was a length, you could easily put this success down to simply being fastest into stride and fastest away. Living the dream, just kept rolling. York style, this is what horses can do at York on this sprint track. They can jump and run and keep rolling out in front. In behind, the second and the third have run really well. There's Highfield and there's Bradsell towards the outside. Highfield, Princess in second, Bradsell in third. And if you look at the numbers, you'll see that Bradsell in particular was very impressive, shaping well from off the pace. He was faster than the winner through the second, third and fourth furlong and equal fast as the winner in the final fifth furlong. But it was just too far back, just had too much to do because Living the Dream had won that race in the very first furlong with brazen speed. Highfield Princess was also quicker than the winner through the final couple of furlongs, but once again, Living the Dream had just got an unassailable advantage out in front and was clearly ready for this race, had been tuned up for this, ready to go and stole it out of the stalls, showing that electric speed throughout, which is so well suited uh, to York. In behind, Cardem posted a nice fast final furlong in, in chase, but he'd been held up not a track really for a hold up sprinter but he shaped like he's still in form he ran very well uh, but he just couldn't land a blow with living the dream out like a shot and away and gone that first furlong absolutely crucial Sean Kiran hit the gates perfectly and now the dream is alive for America for the Breeders Cup that's where they want to go and um, Adam West trainer said that he felt living the dream will be better going around a bend and certainly will jump as quick as the American horses. Um, some of them might not be as slow as Highfield Princess and the others here out of the gates, but Living the Dream is rapid out of those gates, and it was a heartwarming success. We're not to write off Highfield Princess or Bradsell, I don't think. They've both, on the numbers, run very well indeed. I think they've, they've run to form. It's not a question of them underperforming. It's just a question of that horse and this man being able to fire a really quick first furlong which won him the Nunthorpe and a great result for Epsom. That man, Adam West, a tremendous result for that training centre and hopefully they will go from strength to strength from here. Time now to turn our attention to the Melrose, the three-year-olds going a mile and five furlongs and it produced a really good winner in the shape of Middle Earth. Let's have a look at all of the results on the day and the times that were produced. Good day for Frankie with Kinross and Absurd and uh, so taking the, the e-ball for Willie Mullins and uh, he won on Kinross again. That's a horse who just can't stop winning. Middle Earth winning the Melrose at 2.25, just a shade over standard. The times were just a little bit slower than the previous days, but still fast ground. 
Lordship was the 92 joint favourite with Middle Earth. Alhambra Palace was 13 to 2. Davideo 15 to 2. The Goat bolted up at to Goodwood in very soft ground, 15 to 2. 17 to 2. True Legend. Denmark 10s, 11s, and bigger. The rest, and it was Middle Earth from stall nine. Who obliges from Denmark? Who came out of stall number seven? And third home Fox Journey from stall number four. This is a very good racehorse, and he's going to get better and better. He won at Newmarket on his previous start. The horse that he beat there has bolted up by 12 lengths plus at Kempton Park since. And uh, this was a very taking effort from him. In a race that wasn't furiously run, he was able to come home in 107.78. That's his finishing speed percentage through the final three furlongs. So he's finished the race off 7.78% quicker than he ran the rest of it. Now that's a uh, function of the pace of the race, which was not furious and also a function of the fact that he's a fast horse for a stayer and that's why I really wanted to highlight this performance because I think he's a, a stayer in the making, possibly a ledger horse, possibly a cup horse next year, but he's got gears. That's the main thing about this horse. He's got plenty of speed for a stayer. He's not just a horse who's going to slog it out over trips. He's a horse who can quicken. This ground seems to suit him and he quickened up in very good style. His final three furlongs was 35.23, and that means nothing unless you compare it to others in the race. Well, 35.58 was the runner-up, so he's a good deal quicker than the runner-up through those final three furlongs. Edge of Darkness took them along. He's got the big white face. He set this um, ordinary gallop, I think I'd describe it as, and uh, Middle Earth, He's ridden confidently, he's quite a long way back. I was talking earlier on in the show about not being able to, to win from too far back at York, and Nagiri did it impressively with a good turn of foot. And that's what this horse did as well. That's what you need really at York. If you're gonna, you're gonna seed an advantage like this, you need to be able to quicken up. And if you look at his figures here, I think you'd be impressed. For a stayer, this is, this is really good. 10th furlong, he went 11.22. And then he was able to back that up in the 11th furlong with an 11.08 for a stayer. That is, that is going some, that is trapping along. He's quickened up really well. And then his 12th furlong was 11.77. Three sub 12s, getting close to 11 seconds flat for one of those furlongs. And look at the amount of ground he's got to make up. Here he is. Now he may be advantaged by coming towards the stand side up against the rail. It was, I think, a little bit of an advantage, certainly as the meeting went on. But nonetheless, those numbers that he fired are really impressive for a stayer. He beats Denmark, who was keen in first time blinkers. Um, and Denmark ran really well, actually. He's lightly raced. He's only had four races. Perhaps an interesting horse for the autumn. And Denmark was actually faster through the final furlong. Here he is, more towards the middle of the track. But by the time he got going in that final furlong. Middle Earth, who's up against the rail, was away and gone. Quickening up tremendously well for a stayer and for a horse who's perhaps still green, still learning his craft. He's just drifting off the rail a little bit, but he's away and gone. And it's quite impressive here when he picks up and goes away. That's a really taking performance from him, given the amount of ground uh, that he gave up, basically held up in quite a steadily run race, yet he's over, overcome that and been able to get up and win. He certainly doesn't look the likeliest winner here at this stage as you look at the, the head on. He's quite a long way back. So what we can infer from that is, is that if he gets a better gallop and uh, he can sit mid-division somewhere off a strong gallop, he might be even more impressive. He might be even better. So what next? That's the question. Well, that's up to uh, team Gosden, they'll make the right decision as they always do. Um, he needs supplementing for the ledger. Uh, he won this, he's just up for the handicap mark of 93, so um, he's clearly miles better than that. They might think about the ledger, they might supplement him. He's around about the 14 to 1 mark with most firms um, following this Melrose success. But I just wonder whether he could be a cup horse for next year. I think he'll stay two miles and it might just be the cup route that they want to go with him. Could they have just perhaps found a new Stradivarius for the yard in Middle Earth? Big ask, I know. 
who knows how good he could be. But I think out there in the Melrose, he was sensational. The numbers he fired, really impressive. There's loads more to come. So what a week it was at York, and particularly so for Frankie de Tori. He won the Judmont International, and then on the Saturday, with Kinross winning, and then Absurd taking the big one, the Skybet Ebor, for the Willie Mullins team. That just capped it off for uh, de Tori. He's going to be much missed uh, when he retires, and pretty sure he will retire. Lots of talk of him perhaps carrying on now on the back of all of this success uh, at York. But uh, he received a tremendous reception when he came back in on Absurd, and he gave that horse a tremendous ride from still 24 uh, to win for that man, uh, Willie Mullins. And uh, what a way to sign off from York from a great jockey, Frankie de Tour. OK, one more race to look at uh, here on the verdict. We're going to steer away from uh, York and go to Newmarket on Saturday afternoon. There's a, a nice card that they staged. And we're going to have a look at what was the first race on the card. The success for Eben Shaddad, a two-year-old, first time up uh, for the Gosdens, who featured yet again in the verdict uh, this week. It featured a couple of times already with uh, Middle Earth and Mostadaf. Eben Shaddad, 1.54 above the Racing Post standard the times, suggesting that we were dealing with uh, decent ground at uh, Newmarket on Saturday afternoon. So look at the market for this two-year-old contest. And Pisner was the 11 to four favorite. Johnny Concrete was seven to two. Pyrrhic Express seven to two. It's four to one, Eben Shaddad, slightly weak in the market. It was tens and bigger at the rest. And would you believe it, this horse is uh, the Gosden's first two-year-old winner on turf this season. He came out of stall number three. Second horse home was Give It Up from stall number six. And third home was Imperial Express from seven, who perhaps wants a little bit further. There might be one for your racing TV tracker. More of that and on. A bit slowly away, this newcomer, under Benoit de la Sayette. There, white cap, three from the left. Just was a bit tardy into stride. Just had to be nudged along into the bridle by uh, Benoit uh, to get him traveling and to get a little bit of cover. Just shy of mid-division. He's about got himself into about fourth place uh, at this particular juncture. And he shows Lots of speed here, and he's pretty impressive. It's going to give the Gosdens a real good marker on the, the rest of their two-year-olds, because surely they've got loads to fire uh, this autumn. And the fact that this fellow's won will be um, very pleasing uh, to them, because they're, they're probably rubbing their hands thinking they've got better at home. But I think he's pretty good uh, in his own right. The pace was quite honest out in front. They went uh, just over 100%, the finishing speed percentage. But what's impressive is the way this horse uh, picks up final two furlongs. Fifth furlong, 11.11. This is a newcomer, remember, never raced before. Sixth furlong, 12.19. And his three furlong time was good, 34 and a half seconds, compared to the runner-up of 35.21. This is where he's very green under Benoit, who switches his whip to his left hand, but he wants to hang across this way. He wants to go across towards the rails. I'd just put that down to greenness. I wouldn't be too worried about that at this stage. You can see he's, he's almost like he's looking at the crowd, because he's got his head cocked to the right. Perhaps he is looking at something, but look how he's won this. He's won going away, just nudged out hands and heels by the very impressive Benoit de la Sayette for my money. And um, I think he's a two-year-old to keep a, a close eye on. There might be a fair bit more to come from him. And this could be a novice stakes that works out well. I like the way that the third horse who sat here in the sheepskin noseband got outpaced and then boxed on again through the uh, closing part of the race. Imperial Express, for your racing TV tracker, finished the race off pretty well, having looked a little bit green and looked like it was going to drop out about um, two down, but found extra in the closing stages and ran on uh, quite well. I think he's just crying out for a little bit further uh, than this, and on this ground perhaps was just outspeeded by Give It Up and indeed the winner, Eben Shaddad, who's a turn of foot uh, proved decisive and he did it amidst greenness, slowly away from the stalls, a bit clueless in front, but clueless while still running 11.11 and uh, wanting to hang to his left and look at everything uh, as well. So um, Benoit de la Sayette seemed to good effect actually. He was very kind on him in the closing stages. He looked after him and uh, made sure that um, he had a nice learning experience out there. It's very green as he comes back in, doesn't he, into the winner's enclosure. Still looking at absolutely 
everything. And uh, he's a nice two-year-old. And I'm sure we might see him in a, a pattern race uh, next up. I'd be surprised if that's the route they, they take uh, with this fella. And of course, he's the son of Calix, who uh, the Gosdens did so well with. Well, that's it uh, for the verdict this week. I hope you've enjoyed uh, all of the races I put in. Obviously, it was difficult to choose uh, some of the races from York. We could have put the, the Ebor in, absurd success, and Frankie's a decent ride on that, getting the horse across to uh, the stand side. But I wanted Middle Earth to go in there. I wanted Nagiri to be in there. And most of all, I wanted Mostadaf in there because that was a complete and utter masterclass from Dottori uh, from the front. What a way uh, to sign off his career at the Ebor Festival. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.